Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maga. I'm Chanel, and I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Karikov today. Uh, Nikolai Karikov is an associate professor in philosophy and an affiliated faculty in Africana Studies at the State University of New York at Cortland. His research explores the travels of, tra travels of and resistances to global coloniality in Eastern Europe, and is also interested in the discourses and practices of the socialist traditions in the region. His more recent work examines decolonial thought in and from Eastern Europe, the challenges of translating radical theory in a post-socialist context, and regional debates on racism and racial hygiene during the interwar period, among others. Dr. Karkov, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chanel. Um, good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> Obviously, we are from very different places uh, yeah. gathering. Um, I want to thank first the African Studies Global Virtual Forum, of course, and more specifically, Professor Simfri McConey for extending the invitation um, to participate in this speaker series. I should say thank you to Johi also for facilitating logistically this, this kind of gathering on my end, uh, because again, ideas don't circulate in a vacuum. They need some kind of material infrastructure as well. Um, and of course, thank you to all of you for um, giving me some of your time today. Um, I truly appreciate it. Um, now, I am going to begin with sharing my screen, and it should work. So I believe you should be able to see that now. Just to make things a little bit more visually, I think, relevant um, and interesting. Um, as you can see on the screen, there are a couple of words that probably most of us are not used to seeing as part of the same sentence. You have Eastern Europe anti-Black racism, decolonization there. Uh, when people talk about uh, decolonization, even decoloniality, um, often the conversation focuses on spaces that were formerly colonized by, by Western European powers, right? Uh, when we talk about anti-Black racism, more often than not, um, the conversation is on focuses on, on spaces, countries, populations where you have a sizable number of people of African descent. Um, neither one of, the, of these seems to apply immediately to, to much of Eastern Europe. Um, but I think for that reason, perhaps the conversation can get interesting in its own right. Um, after all, the word decolonization was first used in English in the 1930s. Um, as people were trying to speak about the imminent liberation of Africa, for instance, and Asia on the model of what had just happened um, to the Balkan states, their own independence from former empires. Now, because I don't think it's fair for me to assume that you will be intimately familiar with the spaces I'll be discussing, before I begin, I want to share a couple of maps with you to, to situate my comments. So, of course, the first one is a map of Europe with some divisions also based on different waves of ascension into the European Union. Uh, my country of origin, Bulgaria, which will be the focus of much of what you're going to hear, joined the European Union in 2007, together with Romania, they are right here. The second map is a map of the, of the Ottoman Empire, which controlled much of the region for a number of centuries. Um, which again will be relevant for some of the remarks I'm going to make. Uh, Bulgaria again will be right here. It was a dominion of the Ottoman Empire between the late 15th, uh, late 14th, I should say, uh, and late 19th to early 20th centuries. Um, and the final map is a map of Europe and other parts of the world, the way they looked during the Cold War. Bulgaria was of course a part of the socialist bloc and the closest ally to the Soviet Union during that time. So again, three maps to help situate some of the things I'm going to say today. Um, hopefully they will be helpful um, for you as well because some of what I'm going to do is to offer a little bit of history. Now, one way to enter the, the conversation, the complex conversation uh, around anti-blackness and decolonization in Eastern Europe is by way of images, um, by way of representations. All of us, of course, remember what was happening in the summer of 2020 after the effectively the public execution of George Floyd and, of course, many others. Um, as you know, 
protest waves were taking over the US, people were toppling statues, calling for the abolition or at least the defunding of police and other um, white supremacist institutions. At the same time, however, the public response in much of Eastern Europe was quite different. In Bulgaria in particular, there were public intellectuals of quite some influence who came out to publicly claim that the real victims of racism in the US were white folks at the hands of, on the one hand, black people who had gone crazy on the streets, and on the other hand, a hypocritical PC obsessed um, left liberal establishment. But I think the following two responses, extreme as they are, I think illustrate even more what we could claim to be the, the real stake of the conversation. So they might be a little shocking, but they're worth shocking nonetheless. This is a local politician, not particularly influential, fortunately, I should say, but quite indicative. He was protesting outside of the US embassy uh, during the protests, uh, the, the rebellions in the US. And you can see here, the first sign is in Bulgarian, white lives matter. The second one in English, poor English, stop the terror of the blacks, according to him. The second image is even worse. It emerged on top of the entrance to a swimming pool on the Black Sea side resort, one of the hotels there. The image circulated widely on social media and it literally um, took us back to the days of Jim Crow in the US, public swimming pool for white people only. So the questions that I want to, to engage with um, in my talk is or rather, what do we make of these images? What motivates them, especially in a country where people of African descent are still few and far between, especially outside of the capital? Why do you have this vehement anti-Black racism um, in a space which is quite far removed from the commercial circuits of colonialism and historical slavery? And also, what could be some strategies to maybe challenge? these representations and the discourses that support them. So in an effort to engage with these questions, um, I've divided my talk in three parts. In the first part, which is also a little longer, I want to take you on a historical tour of anti-Black racism in Bulgaria as I have been able to identify it. Um, I'm going to be looking at the period between the mid 18th century up until the end of the Cold War in this section. Um, in the second part, I want to address um, a little briefer um, the phenomenon of, I think, what we can call post-communist or post-socialist racism, which is a thing. And in the final part, I want to finish on a more hopeful note, because the rest of it is not going to be particularly pleasant. And I want to address some anti-racist um, initiatives that I happen to know a little bit about. So this will be the structure of the talk. So let's talk a little bit of history first. Um, the first text that I've been able to identify that registers anything like anti-Black racism, or at least sort of proto-racial racist ideas in the country is the founding document of what is now referred to as the Bulgarian National Revival, or we can say Bulgarian modernity. It's a book that was published in 1762 under the title History of the Slavic Bulgarians. Um, it was written by a monk, Monk Paisi, who spent much of his life in monasteries. Um, the ostensible purpose of the book was to challenge what the author identified as the dual yoke of, on the one hand, Greek cultural hegemony, and on the other hand, um, Ottoman political domination. But interesting for my purposes are the opening pages of the text, where the author traces the ethnogenesis of Bulgarians, the origin of the Bulgarian people. Um, mixing somewhat dubious historiography and the biblical narrative. Um, Paisi takes us back to the time after the great flood when Noah now is going to send his sons to help repopulate the earth. So of course, Japheth is going to go to, to Europe, Shem is going to be sent to Asia, and Ham, as we know, is going to go to Africa. Paisi tells us that out of Japheth's sixth son, Meshek, we get the Europeans. Thus, and also the Slavic Bulgarians, which of course means the Bulgarians are European, which is an important point for him. We don't hear much about Shem, but we hear a couple of things about Ham, which probably would come as no surprise. Out of Ham's progeny, the author tells us, we get the vilest tribes and languages. We get the first tyrant on earth, 
who also build Babylon. And we also get the most cursed of all um, uh, the seven peoples, including the gypsies, which of course by that time was significant presence in the Balkans to begin with. So the text doesn't expand on this any further, but you have here, I think in the preliminary form, um, uh, a, a denigration of people of African descent, which is still couched in theological, of course, or quasi-theological religious terms. By the, the time we get to the long 19th century, which is the century of Balkan Southeast European modernity proper, the frame of reference, of course, is going to change from theology to science, but with a significant difference. Um, so for a good part of the still Ottoman 19th century, the dominant science in the country is geography and to a lesser extent history, history because you don't have much to be proud of, which is why geography is more important. Um, so at this time you have a number of textbooks that are published within the span of, of some 40 years, 41 textbooks come out in geography, many of them in multiple editions, um, basically between one and five are published every year. And this is what one of the most popular textbooks in geography is going to say about Europe vis-a-vis -vis the West, uh, the rest, excuse me. The author asks in the textbook, what distinguishes Europe from the other parts of the world? The answer, Europe is the smallest of the five parts of the world, but it holds the first place. Its population is the most intelligent, the best educated, and with its migrations, we probably would use a different word today, has had a, greatest, a great influence on the other parts of the world as well. Trade, industry, and education are the most developed here. And of course, to Europe are juxtaposed uh, the zones of the barbarian world, which includes South Africa, Northern Asia, the two Americas, Australia, and Oceania. Uh, by the end of the century, however, which is also the time of now politically independent and rapidly modernizing Bulgaria, geography and history are going to somewhat lose their pride of place in favor of the new sort of major scientific discourses of biology and especially physical anthropology. This will be the time for those who might have read Sylvia Winter when you have bioeconomic man, of course, as a measure here. Um, uh, physical anthropology in Bulgaria, as much as elsewhere, is very much obsessed with bodily measurements, uh, the shape of the skull, uh, texture of the hair, the, the, the eye color, shape of the lips, the nose, etc. in its construction of differential scales of humanity. Pioneers in Bulgaria include the following two gentlemen, Stefan Vatev and also Krum Bronchulov, both of whom hone the skills of their trade, as you can see on the bodies of African colonial workers in Germany. Um, incidentally or not, they studied with the same German physical anthropologist um, by the name of um, Felix von Luschen, who was still part of the quote unquote liberal or less conservative wing of German physical anthropology to be displaced by much more conservative scholarship by the end of the 19th century is of course German colonialism and genocide are going to take off. But the peak of race thoughts uh, in the country, which is, is uh, we get to the peak in the interwar period, particularly uh, the late 1930s and early 1940s, as the country aligns itself increasingly with Nazi Germany. Um, and there's also, of course, you know, an increasing alignment with the ideas of fascism more generally. Between 1937 and 1941, there's a series of major debates on the topic of race, racism and racial hygiene, which implicates some of the major public intellectuals in the country. Among them, um, again, just to list the names for you would be um, a leading zoologist by the name of Stefan Konsulov, who is also a Nazi sympathizer and non-coincidentally also the co-founder of the very first eugenic society in Southeastern Europe in 1926. His argument is that Bulgarians are a pure race. They are not Slavs, but they are rather close to the Aryan Germans. Another participant is the leading biologist, uh, an internationally renowned scholar by the name of Metody Popov, who argues in favor of racial mixture. For him, there are no pure races. Everybody's mixed. And he also supports the Slavic origins of the Bulgarian people. Um, notably, however, both authors embrace eugenics 
and see biology as destiny. They also draw on large scale blood analysis of thousands of Bulgarians and Macedonians to make their otherwise very different conclusions. What is also interesting about these analyses is they were pioneered uh, toward the end of the First World War by Polish uh, serologists who were testing the blood also among others of colonial troops in Eastern Europe, uh, French colonial troops, in including soldiers from North Africa and West Africa as well. On the other side of the debate, you have the country's major philosopher at the time, Dimitri Mihalcev, who deconstructs in a set of very close readings, the whole project of rooting race and racism in biology. Um, I should add here that one of his models in this is Franz Boas's similar project in the context of the US in the early 20th century. Um, to this day, Mihalcev is seen as the paragon of anti-racist thought in the country, but look at what even this champion of anti-racism still had to say about people of African descent. So he's one of the good guys, quote unquote. Um, he says the following. No one has ever claimed, and these are his words, so um, I'm just reading through them, that if you took an African savage and placed him under the same academic conditions under which our own children study, he would right away catch up with them. Yet the French who created a set of conditions for the cultural development of people of African descent in some of their colonized territories soon found out that the latter are advancing fast. I even had the chance, he says, to see during the 1937 International Philosophers Congress in Paris, a pure delegate from probably Africa who participated very skillfully in the public philosophical debates. And furthermore, there are also Senegalese who are today members of the French chamber. Um, so you can see hopefully here behind what are meant as perhaps even compliments to individual uh, black people, uh, the sense of implicit sort of cultural inferiority of people of African descent. Um, for Mihalcev, white Western Europe continued to be the yardstick politically and culturally, not so much economically because he had his own sympathies um, for the Soviet Union, where he had been an ambassador in the mid 1930s. Now, this brings me to the very complicated socialist period, the socialist interlude in Bulgaria between 1944 and 1989. Perhaps even post racial, or at least colorblind, quote unquote. Uh, there are, of course, important challenges of periodization because there are differences between the Stalinist period and the post Stalinist period as well. Yet, especially the post Stalinist period, basically from 1956 onwards, when Eastern Europe opens up to the third world as well uh, under Nikita Khrushchev. This period is dominated by the rhetoric of anti-racist solidarity with the third world, which, however, is also more than just rhetoric. Um, it, it, this is the time in which tens of thousands of, of students from Africa and Latin America in particular, and also um, Asia, we should say, flock to Eastern Europe and the USSR, often on full scholarships um, to study engineering, chemistry, dentistry, and other fields. And many of them uh, register having had mostly, though of course not only positive experiences. In Bulgaria, you have the state feminist organization, the Committee of the Bulgarian Women's Movement, which is tasked by the Soviets by the 70s with spearheading collaborative projects with women's organizations in Africa and Latin America. Um, so more often than once, Bulgarian women and women of color from other parts of the world team up at major international conferences to challenge the hegemonic agenda of their white um, North American peers. As you can see here, this is an image from, I believe, uh, the Women's International Conference in Mexico City in 1975. Angela Davis comes to visit Bulgaria in September in 1972. She's greeted as a celebrity. People want to have the Afro as a result. 
Her travels uh, around the country become quickly into festive, they turn into festive occasions. She's in Bulgaria for about four days, if I'm not mistaken. You also have um, general know-how and resources that flow directly between the second world and the third world in support of various infrastructural projects in particular. This, for instance, here is the National Arts Theater in Lagos, Nigeria, which was built by a Bulgarian um, construction company. Um, it was completed in 1976, and it was modeled on the Palace of Culture and Sports in the city of Varna on the Black Seaside coast. As a fellow Eastern European put it uh, recently, and of course, it's a statement that needs a lot of qualification, but I did want to throw it out there. Um, state socialism comes the closest that we have ever been to something that looks like reparations on a global scale. Because resources and money flowed back toward African, Latin America, and Asia for the first and so far only time, massive resources since the 15th century, right? Again, the comment needs a lot of qualifications, but I did want to sort of put it for your attention out there as well. At the same time, of course, it wasn't just bed and roses either. The collaborative work was often pursued on the premise of presumed cultural superiority and with a patronizing attitude, as will be the case towards the Nigerias, for instance, on the part of the Bulgarian diplomats or cultural workers or construction workers. Uh, quote unquote, developed socialist East Europeans saw themselves a step higher than their poor and still, un still developing brothers and sisters in the third world. This was the language. Um, of course, much has been written recently about what people refer to as red racism, sort of the muted raciality of socialism. And I'm not going to belabor this point, but I do want to leave you with a, a popular book from the socialist days that I think illustrates these tensions perfectly. Um, what you see here are different editions in different, language, different languages of the extremely popular book um, titled The Island of Tombuktu originally published in 1956 by a Bulgarian adventure story writer, Marko Marczewski. It was republished in Bulgarian. I think there are at least three more editions. It's come out in Russian, Ukrainian, Turkish, Romanian, and many other languages. The book tells the story of a shipwreck on a Pacific island, which is completely off the maps, um, where darker skinned indigenous people live. The, the leading character is a Bulgarian communist. How this happens during the Second World War. He's on the run from the fascists. Um, slowly but surely, he wins over the trust of the tribe and is about to marry the beautiful daughter of the, one of the local chiefs. But then the Japanese show up out of nowhere um, as, of course, imperialists. And after the Japanese, the Americans show up. So by the end of the book, you're looking at how the, the imperialist captain of the American ship has ordered for the island to be burned to the ground because the indigenous people refuse to recognize the sovereignty of the United States. And the Bulgarian protagonist is watching this scene on top of the ship about to leave. So effectively, miscegenation is prevented and indigenous people are all about to die because as prehistorical people, they don't belong in a future um, socialist society, a very Hegelian type of framework here. Um, so of course, this is a little extreme um, as an example, but I think for reasons such as these, um, we can think about socialism, to my mind, as a project of incomplete decolonization. Um, it wasn't the same as what happened under Western capitalism. There were very important links, co uh, collaborations and so on. But of course, people didn't go far enough or as a Bulgarian scholar puts it in a, in a very nice book that came out very recently, um, these are her comments. On the one hand, with socialist modernities, we have distinctly socialist concepts of equality, community, leisure, public access, and social mobility, all of them woven into legacies of anti-capitalist, anti-fascist, anti-colonial, and national liberation movements. At the same time, however, um, these modernities were committed to social progress, modernization, and industrial and infrastructural development with their own teleologies and universals, often converging with Eurocentric, colonial, social, and political orders. Okay, 
So all of this brings us closer to the contemporary moment, the moment of post-communism and again, post-communist racism. The two images with which I began are distinctly post-socialist. They could not have come out like this at any other moment. Um, I think in the history of the country for all kinds of reasons. So even though I have been tracing some discursive and representational continuities of anti-black racism, there are also new things that have come into play. There are new elements of this post-socialist racism that need to be discussed. And I want to talk to you to identify at least three ways in which anti-black racism has been amplified in Bulgaria, but I think also by extension in much of Eastern Europe, um, and especially over the last maybe decade, decade and a half. Um, the first uh, sort of new element has to do with the transition to post-socialist capitalism from the, the early 90s on, of course, the last 30 years or so. Since the end of the Cold War, um, Eastern Europe has been turned into a laboratory of neoliberal restructuring in which race to the bottom logics, um, often violent privatization schemes, in Bulgaria, the lowest flat tax anywhere in the world, only 10%, and also deep collusions between political and economic elites um, have turned my country of origin, Bulgaria, into the poorest and most unequal member of the European Union. So in this hypercharged political context, the growing frustration with the perceived racial other, whether black, Muslim, refugee, Roma, is at least in part a displacement of growing uh, class antagonisms, which people have difficulty articulating for themselves. So racism emerges as a way to sort of live out your own class anxiety, or to refer to, again, as he meant it a, a little differently, but the, this wonderful comment by the late Stuart Hall from Britain in the 1970s, race has become a modality in which class is lived. Now, notably, this kind of racism in Eastern Europe is not only, or perhaps even firstly, anti-Black, but it's part of a continuum. As you can see from the following two images, this is a group, this is a relatively recent image of a group of neo-Nazis banding together um, to look for Roma um, youth to beat up. The second image is from refugee hunters on the southern border in 2015, when a lot of Syrians, of course, were trying to cross into Western Europe. Um, we are likely to see similar scenes now with, of course, what's happening in Afghanistan. I think it's worth adding. The second reason for the intensification of anti-Blackness, to my mind, has to do with what perhaps we can call the re-racialization of Eastern Europeans today. And by this, I mean the re-racialization of quote unquote, ethnically white Eastern Europeans. I'm not speaking about the Roma, for example, who have been racialized for a number of centuries now in the context of the whole continent of Europe. Um, I'm also not discounting here uh, the racialization of Eastern Europe as a region in a lot of Western texts, historical texts, literary texts, travelogues, um, which a lot of people date back to the time of the enlightenment. The East, Eastern Europe becoming the wild East, if you will. But especially with the expansion of the European Union eastward, and now that Eastern Europeans can travel West, they usually end up getting locked into poorly paid, menial, and often seasonal types of work, which also means that they struggle to avoid the racist labels that often get attached to these jobs, labels such as lazy, incompetent, poorly mannered, criminal. Um, the racism facilitates further the exploitation. For example, during the height of the pandemic, I think of last year and early fall, the only flights that were allowed to take place on the continent of Europe were charter flights, taking Bulgarian and Romanian seasonal workers to places like Germany and the UK to pick up avocado or tomatoes or strawberries for the local population. Um, in a post-Brexit world, this is, I have to double check on this, but in January, uh, there was this information that came out that now to get into Britain as a seasonal worker, you would have to pay for a visa. And uh, Bulgarians and Romanians were expected to have to pay more than anybody else. Um, the racialization, of course, precedes the pandemic itself and often in, often in very surprising ways as well. For instance, in an interview with the right-wing magazine in 20, from early 2019, so not that long ago, 
French President Emmanuel Macron had no qualms in stating that he prefers legal African migrants to criminal gangs from Bulgaria and Ukraine. And as you can imagine, in Bulgaria, this caused a lot of ruckus because a lot of people are like, how dare you compare us to the Africans, right? So I think we have a certain kind of psychic logic at work, which is well-tested and familiar. As you become the victim of racist treatment, the compensatory move is often to look for another group, which is lower than you, which you can racially oppress them in turn. And I think the Eastern European response can probably be compared um, to what was happening to especially the Irish, but also later to Eastern and Southern Europeans as they migrated to the US. The Irish were coming from a very brutal colonial history back in Britain. Um, and many of them saw turning into racist bigots as the price of the ticket for becoming white. Um, and the final reason to my mind which has to do with the growth of post-communist racism, has to do with a lack of shared language or a lack of hermeneutical resource for making sense of what is going on. For all of its deficiencies, socialism at least had the language of anti-racist solidarity, which served to restrain at least the more extreme manifestations of, of racism. But because all of this, all of this is gone now, um, racism has become normalized as part of the public sphere. And I can tell you of numerous occasions of speaking to not only Bulgarians, um, Eastern Europeans, both in the US and back in Eastern Europe, who are very proud to call themselves racist. Uh, they wear it as a badge of honor. But it's also not completely true. I think we probably need to qualify the statement that there is no shared language, there is. In the vacuum that opened up, after the collapse of global socialism. Uh, it is often right-wingers who appropriate quite dubiously the language of if not anti-racism, then at least anti-colonialism. Uh, these are some images from a demonstration by an important, until recently quite important, right-wing um, political party called Ataka, Attack, doing an anti-NATO protest. Uh, but again, you can see here, um, along with all kinds of other problematic uh, slogans, the face of Che Guevara. Um, the other language that exists, but which is also increasingly under attack, is the language of liberal anti-racism. You have campaigns in Bulgaria over the last couple of years, such as Children's Academy for Tolerance, and also Find Another Way, the latter mobilizing young influencers and celebrities to challenge what they call the language of hate. But there's little discussion here of the material infrastructure of racism, that it's not just a question of language, it's also about the distribution of resources and power. So it's little wonder in this context that racism reigns supreme and unchallenged. And I'm thinking here of the great Sri Lankan political theorist and organizer, A.C. Vanandan, um, a very important interlocutor in conversations in Britain, who warned us already in the 1980s that racism doesn't stand still, but constantly changes its shape, size, contours, purpose, and function. And I think what we can refer to as post-communist racism um, is also a phenomenon that speaks to some changes of this sort in the conditions of the 21st century. Um, so finally, as promised at the beginning, I want to also finish on a more hopeful note and talk to you about some um, anti-racist and anti-colonial initiatives that we can find in the region, um, which hold some promise at least over the long term. Um, it is worth adding that these are initiatives which are spearheaded by um, intellectuals or academically oriented activists. We're not talking about social movements at this point, which is what you need for real change to take place. The first initiative I am directly involved with, with a couple of younger scholars and activists from Bulgaria, from my country of origin. Um, this past year, we finally started uh, what is beginning to look like a very ambitious translation project of texts from post-colonial, decolonial, um, and set anti-settler colonial theory. You can see the four translations that have already come out. Uh, 
Erika Dussel came out first, the late Maria Lugones uh, with an important publication, uh, Julieta Paredes and Madina Klostanova, who I believe you will have as a guest at some point soon. In the pipeline, there's also translations of texts by Sylvia Winter, Anibar Quijano, Partha Chatterjee, Spivak, Omi Baba, Glenn Coulthard, Achille Mbembe, Cezanne and Fanon, of course. Um, I'm really excited about the project because in Bulgaria, as of now, the only book that exists from the corpus of theory from the global self is Edward Said's Orientalism, which was published already in the 1990s. And of course, if you want to, to see a change um, in the conversation, you need to have access to the tools for doing so. So the plan with this is that we publish a lot of these texts online first, and then they come out in a book format. Um, I'm a little bit on the fringes of the other two initiatives I wanted to share with you, but I, they're worth mentioning because they're both very impressive. And the first one of those is a wonderful summer school. It takes place in a village in Northern Romania, the village of Teltru, every August up until, of course, the pandemic hit us. Um, it's preceded by a conference, then the school lasts for about a week, and it brings together scholars and activists from the region to talk about coloniality and decoloniality in a rural setting. And what is, I think, especially interesting about the project is that there are a lot of workshops and classes which are organized for the children, including the local children, and there are also a lot of ways in which the local Roma community is involved, um, as you can probably see in some of these images as well. There is also a wonderful um, Facebook group that was begun, I think, this year, if I'm not mistaken, um, called Decolonizing Eastern Europe, um, coordinated by uh, a young Hungarian scholar. I believe there's already probably over 1,000 members in this group, which is a private group so far. Um, and it's used as a platform to share resources, to communicate with one another, to help organize events, to make announcements. And a good number of us who have been involved um, in this group have also done other activities as well. Um, and I do want to mention very briefly a couple of other initiatives, which I think are also worth noting. Um, that is the um, Dialogue in Posts Network, which began um, as a conference in the city of Belgrade in 2017 and which exists online. People continue to be doing projects. There has been at least one special issue that has come out of this work. That is also um, a project that began uh, under the affiliation of Leipzig University in Germany under the rubric of Eastern Europe Global Area, where some of us have been meeting and organizing events and projects. And the final initiative that I only know from a distance, but I think is definitely uh, incredibly important, takes place in the city of Pristina in Kosovo um, under the, the heading Balkan Society for Theory and Practice. So of course, all of these initiatives are a drop in the ocean, given the very bleak context that we're looking at. But at least my hope is that over time, um, if nothing else, images such as the ones with which I began are going to begin to meet with a more forceful resistance because people have the language, the tools, and the understanding to be able to challenge them. So I think I'm going to stop here. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your comments and to your questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Nikolai, uh, so sin free, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this um, fascinating uh, presentation. Um, what I want to do is I want to, uh, I want you to help me think through a couple of um, issues that you have raised. The, the first one that I want to try and clarify for myself with your assistance mm -hmm. is the nature of the relationship between, let's say, anti-capitalistic um, struggles and decolonial struggles, right? What, what is the nature of this relationship um, when you situate it, let's say, within Bulgaria or former Soviet post-socialist republic? <clears throat> that is a 
one of the complicated questions. So thank you simply for asking me <laughs> something really challenging. Uh, but I think it is a very, very important and difficult question for a number of reasons. So maybe I can say a few things about the challenges as I see them. Um, one of the reasons why it's complicated in the context of at least the spaces in Eastern Europe that I'm familiar with is that um, a lot of leftists do not take decoloniality super seriously. There is a certain element of class reductivism and a certain understanding, which is part of it, I think, a certain mm -hmm. sense that we have to talk about capitalism first. And if we want to also talk about race, racialization, the long-term effects of colonialism, that maybe we can talk about them as an after effect or an afterthought. Uh, that is this particular challenge. On the other side, which of course also has to do with some of the responses on the part of Eastern European leftists to decoloniality. On the other side, we have a way in which in a good number of texts that circulate from out of the decolonial tradition, the anti-capitalist struggle is also downplayed. And the historical legacy of socialism is also not taken very seriously. So if you think, again, if we operate simply within the corpus of decoloniality, when Alibar Kihano was putting out these texts uh, about coloniality of power, of course, which began to circulate, I think, in the 90s and then 2000s, and of course, picked up, um, he was talking about uh, coloniality of power as an axis of the world capitalist system. So capitalism was front and center, and decoloniality was a very important ingredient. But it seems to me that in a lot of the discussion now, I mean, to give you, of course, a very familiar iteration with Walter Mignola, for example, the three concepts that are very operative, very central to his thinking are, of course, the rhetoric of modernity, the grammar of coloniality, and the, what he calls it, the, the logic of coloniality and the grammar of decoloniality. And capitalism or the significance of anti-capitalism seems to sort of disappear or fade away. So this is one significant problem. The other one is that, again, state socialism, the socialist experience, especially in these very complicated ways in which it articulated itself, um, uh, on the one hand, with the anti-racist solidarity and collaborative projects, on the other hand, of course, with a certain implicit, often explicit developmentalism, this kind of Eurocentric enlightenment values, and, uh, a certain colonial definition of the human that was still present. Uh, but that very complicated experience often gets reduced either to non-existence or to simply a poorer version of maybe Western European or North American orbs of welfare capitalism. So the socialist East disappears as, a, as an important place, an important site from which to think. Um, so I think between these two, um, the... The, the reluctance to engage in decolonial theory in Eastern Europe, and on the other hand, the reluctance to engage in a robust and more complex discussion of, of anti-capitalist resources and traditions in Eastern Europe from the perspective of decoloniality, people often miss each other. My own position, which is also the position of, of course, other people that I know in the region, is that However, a collective struggle needs to be waged and put together. It needs to have very explicitly an anti-capitalist, but also a decolonial or anti-colonial uh, spin uh, direction, um, because you cannot fight one without the other. Without. And, so, and I very briefly, if I may also just say uh, add, add this to this as well, um, what is what I have found to be also um, incredibly fruitful as a resource and. I've been engaging with this work myself together with a couple of other friends for some time now, is um, the, oh, the, the type of work that still has not circulated a lot in Eastern Europe at all, um, Cedric Robinson's framework of racial capitalism. Because it, it does have, of course, both of these elements there explicitly. And of course, I also want to add that this is not to say that we're just talking about race and class, that are complicated, very complicated arrangements, discourses around gender, sexuality, and so on, which are part of the whole package. Um, but I think it is incredibly important not to give up the decolonial or the anti-capitalist in the context of these discussions. So let me get this clear. So for you, intellectually, we need to 
have um, an analysis of a decolonial and, and to carry out a decolonial and anti capitalistic analysis, more or less concurrently. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. Now, my as a follow up to this, which is what I found both your paper and your presentation quite interesting. Mm -hmm. You also talk about what you, let me quote you here. Um, you talk about socialism as, so socialism as unfinished decolonization. Can you just elaborate and exemplify um, further what you mean by that? To my mind, socialism made important strides towards um, decolonization in, yes. in a lot of in a lot of ways. So it made important strides in relation to um, formerly colonized societies in what used to be called the third world. Um, yes. We have important projects, and again, I mean, I also I, I certainly think there was a patronizing attitude. There was this sort of <laughs> sense that we are better than them. We are like the bigger brother who is helping mm -hmm. the young brother or sister mm -hmm. kind of live themselves, elevate themselves, all of this is completely true. But then along the way, in the context of these face-to-face -face collaborations, discussions, I think shifts, important shifts were happening. And again, there was the provision of a lot of resources, including from countries which were relatively poor. Like there were tens of thousands of students from Africa, from Latin America, who came and studied in Bulgaria alone. Yes, yes, yes. And you know. if you want to expand this and you want to talk about, say, the Soviet Union or East Germany, I mean, it gets... Hungary, Poland, especially former Yugoslavia, which was part of the non-aligned movement. So doing its own, charting its own separate course, things get really, really complicated. On the other hand, what, I, what, I, what was certainly the case also uh, is that, you know, there was, the, there was the situation of the local minorities in Eastern Europe, um, which in Bulgaria meant specifically, and most importantly, the Roma and the people who were either Turkish or who were Muslim, Bulgarian Muslims. Mm. Their situation is super complicated. And this is not my uh, discovery. I've read it in other, in other folks. But their situation is very complicated because for them, kind of paradoxically, uh, probably the best time, relatively speaking, was the period of Stalinism. Mm. Because during the period of Stalinism, when they were still operating with these notions of national minority, a certain sense of pluralism, et cetera, a lot of rights and a lot of material support were given to the minority, minoritized communities in Bulgaria. They, could, they had their own newspapers, they had their own schools, they had money from the state to organize a theater, troop, they were quite visible. Um, and then much of this begins to disappear quite rapidly in the post-Stalinist period, especially as the country turns toward a certain form of socialist um, sort of couched nationalism and a very, very violent assimilationist policies in relation to the minoritized populations. So paradoxically, again, you have this, this situation where for the minoritized communities, the Roma and the Muslims, Stalinism was actually better, even though it was worse, generally speaking for everybody else, because it was a politically violent time, right? Um, so you have all of these things. The problem, of course, again, to kind of state this, state the obvious, is which is why it's an unfinished business, it's an unfinished project, um, is that the frame of reference was still one according to which ideas, discursive practices coming out of the Western Enlightenment were seen as a model to follow. So development, unquestioned, becoming literate, unquestioned, um, cultures that don't have access to technology being seen as primitive, unquestioned. Um, and you see this very clearly, I think, in a lot of especially the official discourses about these collaborations. You know, we wanna build uh, the National Arts Theater in Nigeria, but why are the Nigerians so lazy? I mean, you see these kinds of things in the public, in the public discourse, again, you know, not necessarily everybody's discourse, but in the in the official sort of rhetoric by cultural diplomats or public officials, this is often often what you find. Um, so to me, is this kind of really complicated situation where, you know, important gains were made, mm -hmm. but they didn't go far enough, and of course now it's actually significantly worse. Mm 
the, the argument that you raised about the ethnic minorities faring better uh, during the Stalinist era. Um, it's, it's a very interesting one because um, in the discipline that I know a little bit more about linguistics, applied linguistics, there's always a romanticization of, um, let's say, diversity, ethnic minorities and all that. But what you are pointing out is the, an interesting anomaly that you could have a celebration of ethnic minorities and diversity, but that is occurring during a, a Stalinistic dictatorship that the acknowledgement of diversity um, ethnically does not necessarily translate into a form of uh, political liberation at, mm -hmm. a, at a systemic level, that the two, in actual fact, could be completely different worlds. And my suspicion is that the, the, the linguists um, are attracted by the ethnic and linguistic diversity. And then they don't ask the question, does this necessarily mean that the individuals find themselves in a free political space? And what you are saying is that that is not necessarily the case at all. You could have your ethnic diversities, your linguistic diversities, your newspapers, but the, the infrastructure still remains largely dictatorial. Okay, right. Then let me ask the last question, then I end, end over to pass. <clears throat> I like your project of translating some of the material um, the sort of decolonial, whatever, post-colonial into Bulgarian. But what about the reverse? What are the, there must be within the Bulgarian intellectual tradition, a lot of material that you would like to see translated into English and which are these texts? Nice. Um, I, well, it's, it gets, uh, I think, a little complicated uh -huh. uh, for me because um, uh, most of the things I can think about are sort of a straddling, straddling a somewhat ambiguous. Okay. Line. Uh, the, the, one, the one author I can think about, and I've, I actually wrote something about him and it came out, uh, was a very interesting heterodox Marxist who was working in the 1930s and 1940s, who accidentally was killed at the, he died at the same age as Franz Fanon. He was killed at the end of the Second World War in 1944. Um, he is one of few people um, who has taken up what I think is a robust critique of global coloniality in a text he published in the late 1930s, which was actually part of these debates, as I see it, part of these racial hygiene debates. He contributed to it, but he's not recognized as having contributed. He has an interesting text titled um, um, An Optimistic Theory of Our People. And much of this is a deconstruction of the rhetorical claims of Western modernity, and also an exploration of how Western capitalism um, can only, I mean, of course, he takes it from Capital Volume One from the discussion of primitive accumulation. He expands it a little bit more, but he effectively says, without colonialism, there would have been no capitalism. Western Europe would not exist without colonizing all these spaces. Um, so I can think of his work. I think there might be a couple of other texts um, that that would be worth while thinking about from the earlier debates within the socialist tradition in Bulgaria. Um, as for Eastern Europe more generally, I would have to consult with some comrades. Yes. To help with that okay. I'm not so sure that I know intimately enough the Romanian tradition, for example. Then also in Serbia, there was a robust, interesting discussion of, um, of all of this as well. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, Pasi, I can hand over uh, for the time being and then we'll... Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot, Sinfri. Um... Yes, I think we have a first question. Um, Stephanie, Stephanie, would you like to pose your question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for this um, incredibly interesting presentation. Um, I 
I work at a Czech university, so a lot of what you've said resonates in, in multifaceted ways. Mm -hmm. And I've currently embarked on a research project with a PhD student, um, which is an analysis, a content analysis of uh, social media comments in the discussion of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So um, what you said in your presentation, I, I, I would really particularly rang with some with several of the comments that we, we analyzed on social media is what you refer to as Macron say, saying that we rather would like to have educated African people from the Ivory Coast than uh -huh. you know those um, Eastern European mafia networks and I, I found I, I guess one of our preliminary uh, findings is that this this position of feeling peripheral within Western Europe, or at least semi-peripheral, um, like in a sense, you know, being the Blacks of Europe, I think that's that's a kind of sentiment, obviously it wouldn't be put in these terms, but to, to feel that in many ways, um, Czech people, for instance, feel that they are victims themselves of, you know, obviously previous colonization and, and other things, and that the several arguments, the, the the fact that they they were not active in colonization, so it's not really um, so for them. This the struggle of black people is not. Uh, they feel that it's not their problem in a sense. Uh -huh. And then and then there's also I don't know if you find that if there's parallels in in Bulgarian anti-black racism, but um, there's a really quite an ironic twist that um, especially liberal people that feel that if one pays attention to this kind of thing, if one, if one, um, you know, if, if one acknowledges race as a significant category in, in social life, then you also feed or you feed already into a kind of racist type of system yeah so i mean you alluded to that as well earlier on in your presentation so i was just um i was really f fascinated by several of the things that you said because they really hold absolutely true in the in the czech context as well um so i guess one of my questions as well was because you started with the diasporic uh, bulgarian in the states yeah which i also found interesting because i've uh I know some diaspora Czech and German people in South Africa, for instance, yeah, who also often expose, expose, you know, even worse racism that I've experienced among white South Africans. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm my question to you as well is how does this, like the reconfiguration of now the the you know the, the post socialist world in in Eastern Europe how has that really how has that impacted on these identities of white white eastern europeans in a sense that they that they don't feel that the struggles of black people are are in any way um concerns them basically yeah so um have, have do you yeah <laughs> No, that's thank you very much. I think it, this is this is giving me a lot of. Um, I mean, my I'm thinking of so many ways in which to approach both the comments and and I think what was the question? What well, the question was? Um, the first thing I should say also that in my experience, anecdotally, and I don't want to overgeneralize because that's always a risk. But whenever I meet Eastern Europeans, including Bulgarians in the U.S., I'm especially vigilant always. And much more often than not, that vigilance turns to be warranty. Because there is a certain element in my, again, anecdotal experience, there's a certain way that it looks like almost the default route is for you to become racist when you come here, especially if you make it. Because often sort of, to my mind, the psychic logic is this, I came here yesterday, and I'm already middle class or upper middle class. And look at these people in the poor neighborhoods who are racialized. Why are they there for generations? And I just came here yesterday and I'm so successful. Well, there must be something wrong with them, with their culture and so on. I, part, of, part of me thinks that maybe this is the, whether the conscious or not fully conscious logic that people operate under. Forgetting, of course, that if they came here, first of all, they probably had resources to be able to pay their plane ticket. 
Many of them come with education. They speak at least two languages. Many of them come and have access to job opportunities, which other people wouldn't. And many of them also would never be harassed by the authorities. I mean, I've known Bulgarians who were driving without papers and without a proper license for years, without much fear, because they knew unless they had a broken taillight, the cops are never going to stop them, right? So all of these things you have to forget. And of course you have to forget that a hundred years ago, you could have been also lynched as Eastern European because people were, Italians were lynched in New Orleans in the late 19th century, right? I mean, Eastern Europeans could be, the likelihood was of course much smaller, but you would not be recognized as fully white in this society either, you, if you were here hundred years ago. Now, in relation to Eastern Europe, however, and post-socialism, um, my impression is that much of what, similar to what you were saying, that much of what I see in Bulgaria tends to replicate itself with local differences elsewhere in Eastern Europe. And it's an incredibly uh, unnerving, but also complicated thing. Because again, speaking now from my, in relation to my place of origin, on the socialism, you know, what you would have some kind of maybe muted racism, right? If, if there was an African student who came to study and they wanted to, to, to go on a date with your white Bulgarian daughter, the parents might be somewhat reluctant. I mean, so you had this, right? She might be somewhat reluctant. But what you also had under socialism in every major publication, whether, you know, the biggest week, monthly, the journal on, called Woman Today, which almost every family had at home, whether the, the biggest youth journal, every, every issue that came out of these publications would have a couple of pages dedicated to anti-colonial struggles. Whether we are talking about Vietnam, whether we are talking about Angola, whatever, whether we are talking about Angela Davis, her trial was covered in every single issue, right? With very positive, res respectful, and sympathetic discussions, also critical of Western colonialism, racism, and imperialism. So you have all this, and along with, of course, this kind of attitude of we're, we're still better than them, but you have this much more complicated place where people are kind of pulled in different directions. And my, my sense would be that it would be very unlikely that you have a full on kind of KKK type of racist in that society at that moment. Now, if I think the contemporary moment, you have the racism is much more out there. People have no, I mean, every single time I get like together with people, I dread the moment somebody's gonna bring up the topic of people of African descent because I know it's gonna be a mess. And people are just gonna say casually, I don't like black people, you know, without like, as if they don't like ice cream. I mean, you get this kind of thing. And I think probably a lot of it also has to do with the fact precisely that under socialism, there was the comparison, but the comparison was favorable. Africans, African brothers and sisters are maybe they are less developed than us, but we are in the same boat against the Western capitalists. This was the rhetoric. However, Rio is a different thing. Today, the one comparison you don't want to see is to see yourself compared to somebody who is racialized, darker skin. But because you are, because there are always these references that Bulgaria has been third worldized, people use the term, or that the country is becoming a banana republic, very racist term, but it's often used. Um, and because again, comments such as Macron's, uh, and I think recently there were a couple of other things that had to do with housing somewhere in Germany, where they said you don't give, you don't provide housing to Bulgarians, Africans, and the Roma, or something like this. Um, now, when you're pushed in the same place at the same time that you try to do your best to aspire to Europeanness and to full whiteness in, a, in an economically incredibly challenging context and with a lot of existential instability, you act out these anxieties. And I think that probably pushes a lot of people to embrace racism much more openly and much more explicitly. And in a way that at some level you feel like is not even relevant because how many black people are you going to meet? If you live in a small town of 20,000 people, you might see one of them over maybe five years, physically. So they're not your neighbors, you know, right? So it gets this kind of really, really complicated, messy sort of landscape of, you know, acting out a lot of anxieties in a very particular context 
without even having access to a language that might invite you to reconsider. Which is again why we, we want to do this uh, translation project and hopefully have it circulate significantly. And we have also been talking about in Bulgaria with some, um, some friends of doing our own summer school. And my desire would be that at some moment we try to do that summer school maybe also in the countryside, especially where we have the minoritized population. So we can get the local people involved in these activities. So I don't know if that responds to your question. Uh, you, no, you did, you did. And that sounds very promising. I think it leaves one with, leaves one with very hopeful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your question as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, well, while we're waiting for other questions, um, maybe I could just uh, follow up on something Sinfri say. Um, so uh, it was interesting to hear you say that uh, racism seems to evolve. It, it takes on, you know, new shapes. And uh, I was just wondering in terms of the triggers of racism, um, and linking it to economic fortunes of the region. Um, do we see a time when an improvement in the economic fortunes would redefine the shape of racism in the region? Um, is there a sense in which currently the downtown in economic fortunes seems to be leveraged by the right wing? by mm -hmm. the populist uh, regimes in the region to for rabble rousing against uh, black Africans for driving misogynist agendas and so on. I um, think that the worsening economic situation certainly has a lot to do um, with these kinds of responses and you're right. Um, I think to my mind, there are probably two vehicles of, of racism, generally speaking, that have been that I can identify in Bulgaria. And I suspect that is probably the case for uh, the rest of Eastern Europe as well. On the one hand, you have very <coughs> political elites, especially the right wing political politicians and political parties. Um, I think it's happened in other places too, but in Bulgaria in particular, we had a political party that hopefully is not gonna make it into the next parliament, even though Bulgarian politics has been a mess. We've had three elections over two months now, or three months, and they still have not produced the parliament. But the party that was the most racist and ultra-nationalist, and in fact, some people would say perhaps close to neo-Nazism, built a lot of its agenda on this kind of Bulgaria for the Bulgarians. So to help with the Roma, to help with the Muslims um, in a very, very explicit way, and also to help with foreigners and refugees. So a lot of the, I think, uh, anti-racism is cynically exploited by the right-wing politicians. Um, I think that is certainly the case. The other group that has been instrumental um, in this over the longer term, and in ways that are perhaps even more dangerous because they're taken far more seriously by more people are the liberal intelligentsia, the public intellectuals. I think a lot of the racism has come through their facilitation. Now I gave you these images at the beginning of like, the whites only swimming pool and of course that politician. But immediately after 9-11, I remember 9-11, after um, summer 2020, after the, the protests erupted in the US, I remember watching a good number of clips of respected lawyers, writers, you know, sort of uh, professors at university who were invited to address these protests on national TV and in very careful, articulate language, they would make the case Referencing Fox News, by the way, as a, as a primary wow. as a reference there, which is very telling, that the real victims are white folks. The real victims are white folks. So I think there is this kind of situation where the liberals themselves are very complicit, not necessarily unlike some places that we know. They're very complicit and they seem to be very central to the circulation of the much more sinister because less difficult to identify, uh, more difficult to identify uh, racist position. And then there is the situation that within the semi-periphery that Eastern Europe has become and looks like it's going to be for quite a while, sort of economically within global capitalism, the economic fortunes of, of uh, the ordinary people are less 
there is a resurgence of a leftist, strong leftist political movement and political party, these economic fortunes are only going to get worse. Um, every, every time I go back to Bulgaria, I actually see it physically how, how destitute and poor uh, people become and how very difficult it is for a lot of people to be able to make the ends meet. And in that situation, somebody comes and says, it's the Roma who are getting the, the money from the European Union. Or is the refugees who are coming to kind of steal your wives? Or maybe it's these, these few black people that you meet who are kind of polluting the nation. And it becomes a very attractive kind of discourse. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I see uh, Desmond uh, would like to pose a question as well. Thank you, uh, uh, Nikolai. And thanks, everyone, for, for this, uh, this session. And Nikolai, my apologies that I have my camera off. I'm trying to get uh, my family set up for the day here. I think uh, that is sort of anticipates one side to my question. And what I'd like to do is attempt to make some connections uh, between what some of the things you've said uh, and hopefully uh, articulate that as a question that maybe you can help me uh, think through. So on one hand, it seems like it is fairly clear, even with your last uh, comment, that uh, part of the difficulty we are dealing with is not just people who are outright racist, mm -hmm. but also people who might uh, construe their positions as, uh, as a liberal position or, or as an anti-racist position, but still holds on to the, um, the modernist uh, um, universal evolutionary idea. There is one destiny for all humanity, and that is Europe, and everyone should try to accomplish that. And by virtue of that, that calculus, then considers uh, people of African descent or other minoritized groups uh, as inferior or as belonging to some backwaters of, of that civilization. So you have a lot of people who sort of approach this from that, that perspective. And these are people we engage with on a regular basis. I think uh, to, to deal with this, uh, from the perspective of U.S. Uh, racial discourse, there are many uh, Euro white liberals of European descent who are champions of anti-racism, yet mm -hmm. underneath uh, their own ideas are, are notions of uh, cultural deficit. And this idea of saving you know, Blacks from their terrible neighborhoods and, and, and these conditions they live in without recognizing uh, the cultural assets and, 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 and structures of their own communities that have been vilified uh, or destructured by, you know, racist capitalists, uh, you know, sometimes even explicitly neoliberal uh, agendas. So that is on one, on one side. And then I think on the other side, the idea that perhaps we can engage with people intellectually to understand their positions. And I think your translation work you know, perhaps points to, to, to that. And I've wondered in my own work whether getting into people's minds will be enough mm -hmm. to do this work. And I, I appreciate that when you were talking about this, you said uh, this translation work plus the, the other things. And these are these seem like very interesting projects, but they're, they're a drop in the bucket. So I'm, I'm curious about what the other side that will make up the ocean that will flood the system to flush things out, what those might be. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the specific areas I'm thinking about are the structures, the systems through which racism uh, functions. I, I, I don't think I'm as concerned about the neo-Nazi or the KKK that carries the flag and so forth, because those are very easy to identify. I think I'm more concerned about entrenched systems of racism, education, politics, economy, that we accept as normal. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think needs to be done there beyond just having conversations with people that might begin to get at solving this problem? Because I think part of the, the challenge with those uh, liberal-minded individuals who are complicit is that they are bought into, the, their, their livelihoods and survival are tied to those structures. Mm -hmm. to, to, to deal with this, essentially, you, you, you come at people's way of life. You come at 
that the things they take for granted, the ways they, they understand their own convenience. And I think this is when people begin to pull back. So how do you think that work can be done otherwise beyond, uh, beyond the intellectual, uh, the kind of discussions that we, we engage with here? Well, I think um, if I understood your question, probably that is the question, um, because because it is if if the assumption is simply that we need to change the minds of people, then the the the, the original premise behind that assumption is that racism is fundamentally in the mind of the racist. It's a subjective attitude, and at least from my perspective, that is a deeply limited. I mean, of course, it's also there, and it has to be challenged there. But it's also about the distribution of power and resources, which is structural, which is not dependent on, on how you feel and how you think, um, and which is not something you can solve simply by being, um, you know, to use a term that a lot of liberals like to talk about, being a good ally, right? And it's, it takes it would take a lot more than, than this. Um, on, in the context of, of Eastern Europe, and probably in any given context, I think what is what probably would need to happen would be some sort of political mobilization and the emergence of political movements um, in the in working in the which of course is happening already in a number of places uh, where the successes are probably always do come, going to come and to be accompanied by a lot of failures and a lot of drawbacks simply because the forces that people are dealing with are immense, right? So there is this, I mean, this, which is also why I'm not interested in over inflating any of the initiatives that I know about, because I know that they're limited, they're clearly limited. On the other side, in, given that you brought up the question of education as well, um, I think it is important, given that probably all of us are affiliated with an academic institution, it is after all important also what we do um, in these kinds of educational institutions, what we teach, how we teach, uh, what kind of ideas we center, what kind of ideas we choose to maybe decenter in all kinds of ways. Um, and I try to do this as best as I can in my own pedagogy. I teach in a philosophy department, but the vast majority of what I teach, probably 70% of the texts I teach in any course, which I wouldn't tell my dean, of course, but I, <laughs> they're, not, they're not philosophy. Even the introduction to philosophy, so much of it is not. I finish with the big boys from the Western canon, and then we do other things, disability, you know, a radical disability activism, women of color feminism, all kinds of different things. And, 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 and people somehow shift, but again, they shift within the limits of also what you were suggesting with your question, namely changing the minds of a few folks through conversation. Um, maybe one thing I can add to this, and I don't know, I mean, again, I don't feel like I, I have a very good response to your question, but one thing that I also wanted to add that kind of comes to mind is, um, I think, to my, I also, in relation to the context that I focus on, I still think that there is a lot of important work that can be done through the circulation of ideas and, and through the transformation of what counts as legitimate uh, knowledge production or legitimate culture. Because again, a very quick example here, a couple of uh, months ago, I decided to check out the literary, the, the program uh, for high school kids and also elementary school kids. What are the books that they are told that they should read over the summer, which then become the mandatory books for the following year? And it was incredibly interesting and not that much different from the way the socialist literary programs were organized, I have to add. But it was very interesting to notice how in second and third grade, they might read a retelling of the story of Genesis from the Bible. They're going to have maybe one story, which is a Muslim kind of short story and maybe a, a, like a kid story written by, you know, from the Roma tradition. And then from there on, it's a discussion of Western European Renaissance literature, 19th, 20th century, and then you culminate with Bulgarian lit. So you literally have this projection, which is, I mean, it doesn't get any more colonial than this. You begin with, the, and also ancient Greek myths when you were a kid, it's literally, the Greco, Roman, Judeo Christian, West European tradition are culminating with Bulgaria that informs the literary education that you get. There isn't a single author who is from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia. There isn't a single author who is a person of color. And with the exception of two women, none of whom is known to be a feminist, everybody's male. 
right? So even at the level of education, forget about social movements, even at the level of just this plain old education, you know, this is the kind of, the kind of, the kind of work that's happening and, and sort of somewhat incidentally, just as I was looking at these literary programs, uh, there was a big scandal that took place on TV because a, a morning talk show host was asking, you know, why do we, you know, who are the, give me one author from Africa who has won a Nobel Prize, who has been successful. And you think to yourself, it's, it's, that's an easy Google search, my friend. That's a very easy one. But it's literally, I was thinking, well, this is the time when we have to translate this course on colonialism, if nothing else. This is the time, because that's exactly the kind of colonial sequence that you see of who are you reading and who determines who gets to be called civilized and who isn't, right? So again, I don't know if that's a, Desmond, if that's a good response to your concern. I felt like it was bigger than this, but that's what I can think of here. It certainly does address it uh, helpfully. Uh, thank you. And Nicola, if you don't mind, I'll follow up with you for a different conversation uh, yes. related to this. Thank Enough you very much. Thank you as well. Much appreciated, of course. All right. Thanks, uh, Desmond. Um, uh, okay, let me piggy bank on uh, Desmond's own question. Um, interestingly, you've just been talking about the educational context, and I might drag in uh, Stephanie into this discussion. Um, besides the uh, invisibilization of uh, authors from the global south on the school program, um, what do we know of the way in which um, Africa and other parts of the global south are represented mm -hmm. in some of the books which the kids have to read? Because um, school textbooks, as we know, are a very potent source for shaping the minds of uh, children who are at that very impressionable uh, phase of their lives. So what do we know about uh, the stereotypes around Africa, around India, around South America, in the literature books that the kids have to read and so on? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that is a wonderful question, but I do have to do the research before I can tell you. I think it's yeah, no, okay. you're very, you're very right, because, because it is true. This is the time when people get shaped, when the, the ideology yes. Is, yes. Ideologies really permeate, it's the kids who have no access to anything else. So I think that's a question for me to maybe look at and investigate the ge what do the geography textbooks include? What do the history textbooks include? My immediate guess would be, especially with the history textbooks, is that probably you don't find a lot talking about spaces outside of Europe. Um, the one controversy that I do know about, which implicates sort of race, certain kind of racism in a particular way is there have been a lot of controversies around how to represent the Ottoman past in not only Bulgaria, but in much of Eastern Europe, which was under Ottoman uh, dominion. Because one of the things that certainly has happened systematically in waves since the late 19th century is there has been an effort on the one hand to cleanse as much as you can from the past. And on the other hand, to portray anything that relates to today Turkey at the time Ottoman Empire as backward primitive uh, you know, in, you know, perhaps even criminal. The just a very quick comment because your question, I think, was going in a in a in a slightly different direction. But the book that is known to be the most popular book in Bulgaria, it's called Under the Yoke, which dramatizes uh, a very important rebellion of 1876, and rather the failure of that rebellion against the Ottomans two years before the country would be emancipated because of the Russian troops. And on the other hand, the two films that were voted most beloved films of Bulgarian cinematography, one is called Time of Parting, the other one is called The Goat Horn. All three of them are very different, but each one of the three has something in common. Much of the action develops around sexual violence or efforts at attempted rape of young Bulgarian women, in fact, almost girls, by Ottoman Turks. Right, the book was written in the 1880s. The films were came out, I think, one of them in maybe 1950s, one of them in the late one of them in the late 1980s. But you literally have the trope in all three of these cultural artifacts of the Ottoman rapist, which begins to kind of circulate in Bulgaria, as far as I can tell, 
at about the same time, and of course, admittedly, in a different context with a different history, etc., is you have the trope of the black rapist beginning to circulate in the United States, right? And beginning to kind of take on as Jim Crow is also going to be implemented and so on and so forth. So you also have these kinds of very interesting parallels uh, taking place. But, uh, you know, apart from these kind of casual comments that you hear ever so often, in terms of institutional racist practices, the most immediate recipients in, I think, much of Eastern Europe are the local minoritized populations, which means, of course, the Roma, who literally live in ghettos, like mm. in my country, that a ghetto surrounded by a wall. Mm. And there's one door that you can go through. And in much of the pandemic, the door was closed. They could not even leave the ghetto. We're literally talking about a ghetto, right? Like on the model of, of, the, of the early ghettos as they were enclosed for, for Jewish people, for instance. Um, so much of, the, much of the racism is against Roma, against Muslim, and also refugees that have been coming in. So, um, but, but yes, I think that this question of sort of, you know, looking at the educational ideological components that is, you know, if, if I end up writing something about this, I will have to give you some credit, Vasi. Thank you very much. It is something to investigate. It is something to investigate. It is important. Yeah. Very good question. Yeah. Well, count me in. I'll dust off my uh, Bulgarian. <laughs> and we can do that together. <laughs> okay, dear yeah, colleagues. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, thank you so very much uh, for spending some time with us and sharing your insights. Mm -hmm. uh, um, just before I hand over to maybe Sinfri would want to say a word or two. Yes, um, I think this was a, a very interesting um, conversation. I think it um, illustrated the importance of trying to look at our discussions about decoloniality, Southern epistemologies, globally because like i mean um like our guest was pointing out the challenges that the former uh, socialist republics pose in terms of thinking through decoloniality i think that was a very important point the issue that um, was going through my mind as we were discussing and something that i have read about a couple of times the importance of being sensitive to different regional genealogies in the decolonial thoughts and practices. Yes, and yes. Um, I thought, yeah, that would be interesting. So what would be interesting is we move forward, for example, we're going to meet um, Martina Stanova, for example, who works with um, Walter Minola as well. So it'd be interesting to get a take on gender um, issues about coloniality, given the geographical and political location that she, she works in. Then the other issue that came up, which I thought was very interesting was, they kept coming at the phrase, not fully white. Um, and I was beginning to wonder in actual fact, whether in the Bulgarian context and in other contexts, whiteness is seen as a continuum with mm -hmm. some fully white, others not very white and they sort of along that, um, that continuum. And then if that is the case, I was asking myself, is blackness also seen as a continuum or you're either black or not black and there's no uh, sort of uh, continuum about blackness. And so that was really quite interesting. But I think the nature of the relationship between socialism and decoloniality is something that we need to keep coming back to yes. and speak to what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Then the last point I wanted to make is it's, it's interesting, but I remember talking to Bice about this. It's interesting that you can have anti-Blacks even in contexts in which there are very few Blacks, but you can also have pro-white even in contexts in which there are very few whites that people have ever seen. Uh -huh. Am I, am I correct, but Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That you have people who are pro-white, but they've never seen any, any white person in that community. Uh -huh. <laughs> then you have another group that are anti-black, but they hardly encounter any blacks in their lives. <laughs> can I, can I, can I, can I, sure, please. 
Can I Hang comment? Because I think these were fascinating things that Simfi was saying, and I just wanted to. Um, so very quickly in relation, I'm very glad that you're getting Madina Costanova, and I'll be curious, of course, if Walter Mignolo shows up to also listen to him. Madina yeah. was the first person I read who spoke about Eastern Europe, sort of the Eurasian yes. yeah. decoloniality, yeah. you know, because my first introduction to decolonial theory was in Binghamton through people like Maria Lugones, who at the time was, of course, alive and working. And Binghamton was a very, Binghamton University, which is where I graduated from, was probably the earliest hub in which there were decolonial conversations in the 90s. Before there was Duke, before there was Berkeley, there was yeah. a modernity coloniality working group in Binghamton, mm -hmm. especially around the sociology department and world systems, which of course mm -hmm. was yeah. the place yeah. where they were born. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, at the time I thought, well, decoloniality is great, but what about Eastern Europe? And Madina's yeah. work was the first yeah. one for me to be like, you know what, that is something to actually look at quite seriously. And Walter Mignolo has yeah. been uh, quite an important thinker for me for a long time uh, because there are a lot of fascinating insights I have found in his work. To me, that kind of aspect of dismissing socialism is, is an issue, but it, of course, it doesn't disqualify the high quality of the work. But in relation to the things that, that you were saying about the continuum of whiteness and blackness, yeah. which is incredibly, incredibly important, um, I do think that from the perspective of Eastern Europe, one can certainly think about the continuum of whiteness. Okay. And I'll just give you one quick, but I think a very revealing example. Almost, I'm sure, almost every single Bulgarian at a certain moment would have heard a comment such as what I would have heard from my mother, for instance, who would tell me as a teenager, here's 20 lever for you, the local currency, go buy yourself a new pair of jeans so that you look like a white man. <laughs> uh, in Bulgaria, there is this saying, in Russia, I was told the same, I was told it's the same thing, you know, kind of try to live like a white person, like a white man. Uh, and of course, we only say this to someone when their own whiteness is at least partially in question. Mm -hmm. And I do think from the perspective of Eastern Europe, of Western Europe, especially now after post-socialism, where you've had a flood of, again, Eastern European migrants kind of coming mm -hmm. to work often for cheaper, um, they're portrayed as taking away the jobs, maybe taking away, if it's men, taking away your wife, etc. Uh, <laughs> there has been there has been a ramping up of, of anti-Eastern European racism very clearly. Sivan uh, the, the this Sri Lankan thinker who I mentioned talking about racism changing shape, he, I think, maybe in 1990, had this wonderful short text um, on the topic of what he called xeno-racism. He says, with the collapse of socialism, and now that you have these migrants coming from Eastern Europe, we have this new form of racism, xeno-racism, which is white on white type of racism. <laughs> and I do think it makes sense to argue something along these lines. On the other hand, of course, in the context of Eastern Europe itself, if you were to compare an ethnically light-skinned Bulgarian such as me mm -hmm. to a Roma or to a Muslim uh, person who might also, by the way, look like me, so it's not a difference in phenotype, there's absolutely no question that the public reading would be this is the human being, and the humanity of the other one is questionable. So it gets really complicated. On the other hand, in relation to what qualifies as blackness or being a person of color, I mean, I've had people who have come visit my hometown who are people of color, but they are light-skinned. And the person, for example, is a Latina. She might read in all kinds of exotic ways, but when you talk to anyone, nobody would say she's a person of color. She's white. So you have also this kind of continuum of, if not exactly blackness, you have these super kind of complicated and, and, and not particularly nuanced readings and mappings onto people's bodies where, you know, it's anybody's guess. If you're darker skinned, you're going to read as black, no question. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, again, if you're darker skinned with an American passport, if you're American so. skin, things also begin to shift a little. <laughs> 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 I, think, I think it is it is a very important question that you are you know, uh, this continuum and these different gradations get incredibly complicated in the society. I think that's a good one. Okay, thanks a lot. So um Nikolai, once more we are really very grateful for for your insights, for sharing your expertise with us, and we hope that uh you'll 
become something of a more permanent uh, feature of our ongoing discussions. Uh, we really value your perspective. Um, so um, thank you once more. And I'd like to ask Kim to perhaps tell us who 